after my near death experience or near life experience, because I became alive um, when that experience happened, it, it woke me up and it really, it revealed to me that, you know, we we're not dead. We'll never die. Um, I was more alive than anything before. So it's just only enhanced and it woke me up, but before I was dying. <laughs> so on here on earth, I wasn't living heaven on earth. I was slowly le leading my life to an inevitable death and I was finding every way subconsciously and through a tainted spirit and uh, ego mind um, to find ways, different ways to, to die. I'm here today with Malcolm Nair. Malcolm was born defying the odds. His early years were marked by harsh abuse and adversity. Awakened by a near-death experience in 2010, Malcolm forged a new path, leaving fear and violence behind. For the next 15 years, driven by a thirst for holistic well-being, he delved into the mind-body-spirit connection. Malcolm is here to share his near-death experience and some of the lessons that he learned in that near-death experience with us today. Malcolm, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate it, and you're very welcome. So take me back to 2010, or or if you feel like there's a backstory that you want to include, tell me how this started for you. Yeah, there's a huge backstory. There's a huge uh, realization that came through um, after my near death experience or near life experience, because I became alive um, when that experience happened. It it woke me up and it really it revealed to me that you know, we, we're not dead. We'll never die. Um, I was more alive than anything before. So it's just only enhanced and it woke me up, but before I was dying. <laughs> so on here on earth, I wasn't living heaven on earth. I was slowly le leading my life to an inevitable death and I was finding every way subconsciously and through a tainted spirit and uh, ego mind um, to find ways, different ways to, to die, like, you know, health, mindset, you know, um, drugs, alcohol, abuse. I was very toxic. I was alcoholic. I was abusive. I, was, I did lots of drugs and addictions. I was addicted to um, crack cocaine and cocaine. Uh, I used to do mushrooms. Um, I used to do so many bad things. Um, and I was immune to the tolerance. So I would be able to do so many different types of drugs at the same time. And I would do it for days on end. Um, and also that, that, that was like moments and chapters in my life. There were other moments and chapters where I was just a child you know, and, you know, I witnessed a lot of abuse and I've, I've witnessed a lot of struggles and turmoil. Uh, you know, I've witnessed, um, you know, lots of car accidents. I've been in lots of car accidents as a child, being in the front seat with my stepdad, for instance, or abuse such as being a child and having your stepdad take a knife, a kitchen knife, and threaten you to get into a scolding hot bathtub. So he would put it and threaten me to get in the tub and I would burn and uh, just things like that. And my parents, they were divorced when I was one years old and they both got remarried. So um, through that experience, um, there was a lot of struggle and, and turmoil amongst them as well, like with alienation and dealing with like uh, child custody and uh, dealing with them picking me up and dropping me or taking the airplane at such an early age, uh, getting escorted by, you know, um, the flight attendants early, so young, like five years old, four or five years old, and, you know, dealing with police officers, transporting me as well, picking me up from the airport and kind of delivering me to my parents' house, like there's those experiences. And then also a lot of memories of my dad driving, picking me up or my mom sending me off crying, you know, cause she wouldn't see me for three months out of the year. And then by the time I was in grade six, um, 
my 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 on my dad's side they enrolled me in school um without my my mother knowing <laughs> so they registered me in school and got me going in the year in the school year <laughs> and when it was time to go back for summer go back after summer holidays my mother found out drove down big colossal event and she ended up losing and, and because they used a lot of tactics against her and using me as a child uh, in front of social workers to speak negatively. So I was used as a pawn and I was always around cuss words and swear words and just a lot of disgust. Um, so early on, I, I started smoking and running away and leaving home and uh, cheating in school and stealing and theft. And, you know, I, I also uh, hitchhiked, you know, <laughs> I also took a bus, a Greyhound bus from one province to another, um, you know, and I just did a lot of bad things, a lot of um, things that you wouldn't expect a child to do. I got into sex early at 12 years old. Um, I started smoking and drinking at eight years old. Um, I started learning and, and just expanding my mind and my consciousness in the wrong ways, like around like entities and de demonic things and watching horror movies and uh, rated R movies and X and cousins teaching you things that you shouldn't be learning at a young age, talking about sex with older women and, and all these things were getting into my subconscious mind from an early age, let alone my parents divorced at one from an abusive, toxic relationship. So my mom drank bleach when I was in her stomach. Uh, my dad used to beat her and abuse her. And the abuse and the beatings never stopped with other women when they divorced and vice versa. My mom was just traumatized from that. So she became very uh, toxic herself. So she was aggressive and she was uh, she, she was insecure and jealousy. So my jealousy and my insecurity uh, came from my mother choosing men over me. So my, my insecurity and jealousy with other relationships didn't come from the women I was with. They came from my mother, you know, and, and, and just not feeling safe, feeling abandoned. And also from my father, I had father issues, mother issues. So a lot of things like that, that, were in my subconscious. So living life early on, I feel I didn't have right from wrong. I didn't know a good direction. I didn't have intentions. I always wondered and worried about life. I had typical things like scarcity and stress and depression and anxiety and fears and uh, worries about money because I'd watch my mom worry and struggle and, you know, my dad, you know, being the way he was. <clears throat> so that kind of led to my belief system projecting thoughts and and casting out curses and spells that I didn't know were reflecting out into the universe or to the world and I was receiving who I am so that's how manifestation started off for me was I was attracting everything that I wanted um, you know everything that I didn't want I was attracting so if I didn't want to uh, get in a bad relationship, I got in a bad relationship. So these cycles and these patterns and these karmas uh, kept occurring in my life. And I didn't know how to change it. I didn't understand personal growth. I had no idea about uh, thinking positive. I honestly, my, my, my paradigm, like my, my culture scape, my reality, my environment, there was no personal growth there was no one talking about love and respect and appreciation it was always condemning and judging and prosecution and you know just a lot of trauma so that I feel tainted me and that was my learning in life and everything I witnessed and observed led to uh, destruction so relationships led to destruction hanging out with friends led to destruction there was no learnings and teachings. I wasn't gaining any wisdom. It was just worse and worse and worse rock bottom. I, when you think there was a rock bottom, there was another rock bottom. Um, and eventually I just got older living like this and I got worse living like this. 
So if, if, I, if my life was that since I was one years old and eight years old, I started smoking and drinking. Can you imagine? By the time I was 14, I was already a crack addict. By the time I was 15, I was already homeless. Um, so I was attracting uh, that. And I've already been in abusive relations. I was repeating cycles and generational curses and all the all the things that people want to say. And then the diagnosis is people, you know, like not people, but hospitals, doctors, family members would say, oh, he has short-term memory loss or he's dumb or he not, they wouldn't say that to the teacher, but they'd say he learns slow. Does he has ADHD, right? Right, right. <laughs> Take him to the doctor. He has something, right? And then they'll say, yeah, he has this, he has that, you know, yeah, he has a learning thing. So when they would, my parents would take me to school, they would approach the school with those diagnoses or those problems. And that's what you should not do. But anyways, that's what they did. So they, they, they treated me as such. They put me in ECL with this kind of English. I spoke English, but my, my vocabulary, my, um, the way I, I articulate things, the way I, um, my memory was worse the way I would read. I couldn't read properly. Like those things were all off, but it was only because of my upbringing, my trauma and, and all the switching back and forth from different uh, homes and so many things. By the time, you know, I was like 20 or 22, I've moved into over a 100 homes. I've worked over 100 jobs and it was just like intense that that's already intense right there. So uh, the, the coming to um, 23 years old, okay, we don't have to dive deep into addictions and more, more stories of trauma and things that I've done. But by the time I was 23 years old, I was working at a uh, warehouse, a pharmaceutical warehouse for shoppers drug mart. And I was doing forklift and I was doing shipping and receiving. And um, it was then that I think it was a Friday, I go home and all I wanted to do was uh, hang out, drink, you know, go drive around and have fun and meet up with friends and girls that try to get girls, different people all the time and go to bars and pool halls and, you know, that typical type of guy. Yeah, the, not typical guy, but that kind of guy. That's kind of what I was. And I was like bad like that. And so I end up uh, speaking into existence or thinking or feeling into existence what I wanted to drink, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, who I wanted to hang out with. And everything occurred. Everything actually happened. So I end up going to the house that, you know, had the girls and the drinks and the alcohol and the drugs. And and there's girls in the kitchen, there's guys in the living room, there's girls and guys on the deck outside. And I'm already drinking, pre-drinking, have drugs and mushrooms. And, and I'm just like taking it out of the bag like it's candy. And uh, they're doing cocaine and they're offering it to me. And I still feel, felt unfulfilled. I felt no purpose. And I, I was longing for more it was never enough and i just said i need to go i need to find someone else to hang out with somewhere else to go and do more of this like crazy stuff so i end up getting leaving and getting in my car and and they say uh are you sure right should someone go with you whatnot they'll drive you they'll drop you um and and so I end up going in, in my car and I start driving. That's what I think I remember. Um, and I'm driving so fast that I can't like see, like lights are just flashing uh, past me. Like when you watch those movies, just lights and everything's just going right past you. And that's how fast I was going. I was going about hundred kilometers an hour or more, maybe 120, 130. Um, by the time I side swiped two vehicles and I, instead of pushing on the brakes, I push on the gas and I go 
up a lawn and I hit a house going 100 kilometers an hour and I ejected headfirst out of my vehicle. And I became self-aware at that moment where my spirit left my body and I was just noticing and witnessing what just happened. And I hear right away the, the people living in the house shocked, woke up in shock. The son wakes up out of his bed, gets out and says, oh my God, what was that? Did a bomb go off? So um, his mom comes, they meet each other upstairs and they go outside and they look at my body and they're like, oh, like, oh my God, what do we do? So they call the cops, they call the ambulance, whatnot. And they're doing the, before the investigation and everything took place, my spirit realized that I was kind of in between the steering wheel and kind of propped up and stuck between my, uh, the, the house and my car, the hood of my car. I was like crushing, like crushed and bent. And so my spirit must have come back into my body and I drug myself, I dragged myself across the hood of my car and laid uh, on the passenger side of the hood. But remember that I woke up with paralysis and I I was like, there was a ton of bricks that landed on me. I could not move. Uh, so in the investigation, uh, they have it that I was on the passenger side. They don't know who was driving the vehicle. He has trauma to his head, brain damage, a lot of suffering, bleeding in his brain. Uh, so all the criminal record, all the drinking and driving, I was 10 times over the blood alcohol level, got dropped uh, eventually, right? But in that moment, um, I'm aware and I'm hovering over my body and I can see everything. And I'm witnessing them trying to revive me saying you know he has lost too much blood uh we're losing him i have like uh shards of glass all in me look like scars filled everywhere cuts and they're trying to um you know revive me so they said we're losing him and they start driving to the hospital and i hover over my body and i'm just following my body all the way to the hospital and I get there and as I'm getting there, I can hear the phone call of police officers that aren't in the ambulance calling my mother and I'm, I'm all, all ready hyper intuitive. So I'm already uh, at all places at once. I can already read frequency. I could already hear and feel thoughts, feelings and emotions. I can hear them. I can, I hear thoughts, feelings and emotions. So I can hear the officer talking to my mom. I can hear then the call going to my dad. I can hear them them like crying or breathing, calling my sister and then calling different family members. And I know word for word what everyone is talking about. And I'll come to it later where I tell everybody exactly what they were saying. So, but I'm able to do all this. And so I get to the hospital and I'm following my body for surgeries and, you know, they're diagnosing me, seeing what I have, what they don't know, they're discovering, they don't even know like what, if I'm a vegetable or what, all they knew is he's, he's unconscious, he's um, on life support and um, we, we don't know. That, that was all that they knew was not, they didn't know. Uh, his family kept asking, what does he have? Does he have neck injuries? He must, but we don't know if it's C1 to L what or what it is. Uh, we don't know what type of injuries he has. We can't tell at this point. He just lost so many, so much blood and he has glass. Let's just, you know, they're taking out chunks and chunks of glass from the back of my neck, back of my head, from the front of my face and my head, my body everywhere. Uh, but I had my tibia fractured, my left, I have two bolts in there, my lung collapsed, I had bleeding in my brain, um, I had spinal cord injuries from my neck all the way wherever they, they don't, they didn't even know, but I, I kind of um, self healed those kind of things. Uh, eventually, I'll talk about it. What were you feeling when this happened when you're watching the people come out and they were discovering your body? Were you thinking about anything or feeling anything then? 
Yeah. So I was wondering why they don't know anything. And I was wondering if I could just tell them what it is. Like, I, I was like, well, I know where it is, what it is. Like, I, I'm healing it already. I'm super aware of it. Um, and, but I had, I couldn't do anything at that time until my, until I come back into my body and I was uh, awake from life support. And then I was able to actively go into my cells and my body, my bones and heal everything fast while they were trying to uh, diagnose me still, I was healing. So at, while they're trying to tell me how long it's going to take to heal, like six, eight weeks, eight months, 12 months, one year, I was already saying, no, I'm healing. I'm healed. And they were already laughing at me uh, in, in their head. I can hear them acting like professional, but like almost like a narcissist, like these specialists and doctors, like arrogant in their subconscious. I can hear their arrogance, but they're being professional doctors. They're not laughing at your, to your face, but you can, I know their arrogance. I can already read their arrogance. Um, so, so anyways, I didn't really care. I didn't listen to anything that they said. I was just, I was shocking everybody. I was telling everybody, no, I'm walking, I'll get up. They, and they were holding me back. They said, you just woke up off life support. You, you can't be walking. Your, your bones are broken. I'm like, no, they're healing. They, were, they thought I was crazy. Uh, but I really felt my bones fusing back together. I felt my lungs and I said, check. So they went and they checked and they were able to pull the, the tube out of my lung. And they said, yeah, it, it's expanded. And, you know, yes, I'm not going to say that it took six days. It took three days from the day from, from when I woke up, it, it expanded, but um, I was using the, the breathing stuff to strengthen my breathing, my lungs. You have to do that. But, but in three days, it recovered, right? My, I walked out of the hospital in six days. They discharged me fr from life support to walking out of the hospital in six days. I was recovering so fast. Um, so things like that were very unique and that they've never seen before. But while I was on life support, um, I noticed that my body was suffering a few times where I couldn't breathe with the breathing tube and the neck brace, the way it was positioned, like everybody has a neck brace that's in a severe car accident. But for me, I was able to have control of my spirit going back into my body and taking off, giving my bones and my arms and my fingers and my wrist the power to take it off and take out my tube and then and then like be back on life support. So these things I was able to do. And when the nurses, my mother saw my body, they were frantic. Like they were shocked. They were like, sh my mom like cried and screamed, like what's going on? Come here, come here, what's going on? So the nurses checked, they went to get the specialist while the curtains closed, my mom opened it. And I, I used, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I don't know if it's, not telekinesis, not pyrokinesis, but um, uh, clairvoyance or whatever, but to tell her I need water. And I also went like this. So there's, there were, there's things that I'm able to make people do or think. Um, so I told her and she told the nurse right away, my son needs water. My son needs water. And they're like, how do you know? He told me. They're like, he can't tell you. He's on life support. <laughs> and uh, my mom uh, was like, no, he told me. He went like this. So, so they start to think me and my mom are weird. And then so the nurse told the specialist what's going on. And they said, okay, well, he's um, showing signs of waking up maybe. So let's tell the family that they can unplug him. And so while my family's making those decisions, my mom came up with the decision. They go, my, and as my mom made that decision, um, slowly but surely, because I could hear all the conversations and everything going on, and they finally came to that decision, my mom comes to the wall. And right before she was about to unplug, I leave my body and I, I enter a... Um, 
I always stumble because there's always people call it so many different things. And I still, um, we, we don't know what it is. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's right or wrong, um, but it's not a tunnel. It's not a funnel. It's not a vortex. It's, it's, it was like spirit. Like it was a translucent, like another spirit that took me up. It felt, and I was in that and I can see everything because everything's like kind of, uh, lucid and translucent and, and I can see all the lights and stuff. And then it's going faster and faster and faster. And I start to only see black and darkness and I start to worry and I start to doubt and I start to fear and all the subconscious thoughts start coming up. And in that moment, my spirit guided me to surrender and detach and, and trust in the unknown and, and, be safe in the darkness. And when I started to recognize that I calmed down and I trusted and I, I detached and I surrendered into the unknown. And I, I started to just now get taken away and it started to slow down and I knew something else was happening. It started to become very calm and different. Like a, like, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a um, so, so like different slides going in different slides at a beautiful swimming indoor swimming or outdoor swimming and there's different types and you you're going through but there's times where you just feel that ease and that cool feeling that's what that felt like when I finally surrendered and started taking me and and then it turned white um, and I came to a halt and and I started to be more aware of my surroundings. And I started to hear and see and feel different emotions and entities. Uh, not, they were not alien, but they were angelic beings. And they were spiritual beings. They were like guardians. And they were like 12, maybe more. Um, I don't know why 12 is a significant number, but, you know, if I because I would always think of it, visualize it and always try to close my eyes and remember. And I would like see how many people were there. And I, I recognized them and they recognized me and I felt home and I felt safe and I felt welcomed and love and compassion. Um, but I was in wonder. I was wondering, contemplating like, but I just messed up my life. <laughs> but th that's not my life. This is my life. And I was like, this is home. Like I feel home. That's not home. And I would think of my body and think of the flesh and think of that, that, that this reality. And I would be like, um, so what was that? Was that a dream? You know, what, what reality was that? And I would start to see uh scenes and i would have a life review and i would be able to see uh all the conversations i've had all the like people that i've trusted or i didn't trust or people that i broke trust with or promises or being a liar and 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 over promising and under delivering like statements to to people who have helped me and been there out of the kindness of their heart and how I was a user and uh, you know, all the things and the flaws. And I look over to my right and I see a massive divine being that was a hundred times larger than the, the already massive guardians um, and lifts his head up and it's huge. Looks like, looked like Zeus. So my representation is like a white, like it was either like, it had a beard. So it couldn't have been Krishna or like Vishnu in the, in the traditional Hindu cultures, but it looked like, like a Zeus to me. And, um, and Maybe that's subconscious because I grew, I grew up, you know, studying uh, Greece and, you know, Roman 
uh, numerals and all that kind of stuff. Maybe everything is subconscious, but there's millions of testimonies like this. So I don't think everyone's having subconscious memories. Um, who knows? But so I see this divine being and he asked me, are you ready? And, and I, I thought, I'm like, ready for what? And I believe he wanted to know if I was ready to come back, welcome and leave everything and be there and just be welcomed and, and go back in, in the line with the rest of the guardians and become a guardian too. And just, and observe and watch everyone on planet earth, you know, being a witness and a noticer and a student. Um, but I looked at my life and I was the biggest judge and I'm like ashamed of myself. And I said in my mind, I, in my spirit's mind, I'm like, how can I leave? How can I leave? I got to go back. Like, you know, how can I do that to, to everybody? You know, I, I thought I was a superhero. Like I'm going to, I can fix this. Like it was easy. It was like, Oh my God. Oh wow. Yeah. It's easy. Love. Like I, I'll just go back and I'll be experienced now and I can overcome everything and I can be powerful and I can change and I can be caring and kind and start telling the truth now and being a beautiful person. And so I'm like, yeah, I want to go back. <laughs> and yeah, right. <laughs> Anyways, so he asked me, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure. And right when I made that oath and that dedication and that decision, I was granted, I was welcomed to go back. I wasn't questioned like again or, or, or said, no, you can't do it. It's going to be hard. But I had a sense of he knows but doesn't know what's coming. But okay, my child, you can go back. And so I went back the same way that I entered down through the white and then into the black, into the darkness. And I went back and I show up into the atmosphere and I go back down and I can see everything. Uh, you know, I could start seeing the clouds and the terrain and I can see, uh, you know, all of the just everything. Oh my God, it was beautiful. Like you could see everything like you're flying. Like, you know, if you've had lucid dreams, it was like that. And I'm, I'm like flying, hovering and floating and back through the hospital, back into the walls, into my body. And then 10 minutes later, that's, and then that's when my mom unplugged me. And then 10 minutes later, I go upright and I wake up and I look at my leg and I already knew my sister and my mom were there. But instead of being beautiful and having a touching story at the end, I wake up and say, what the fuck happened to my leg? But in a, in a negative way, in such a, like a bad, bad way. Like, like, what the fuck happened to my leg? Like, I was just so like that. And you know, we all get upset, we get mad. And sometimes we have that type of energy. And that's the energy I had. And so I, my mom said to me, well, shouldn't you be grateful? You just woke up and you're here now, you know? And my sister's like, oh boy, he's back. And, and I was like, yeah, what? Well, and I was just toxic. I was just judging and crucial and condemning. And I wanted to brush everything out of the carpet under the, like that was brushed and bring it back and be like, I was more aware and heightened of all the trauma and struggles I went through, but I didn't know how to handle it with love and embrace and compassion and love. Did you remember what had happened? It was in and out. So I remember, but I would forget in this realm, in this experience, like I'm waking up, I'm in the hospital. So I'm not thinking of that. I'm thinking of here. So I'm here doing my thing. And then subtle moments would come where I would remember. And I would just in, in my subtle moments, I'd be like, huh, hmm. 
what? Huh? I, it was like that. It was like, I was, it would like hit me. I'm like, huh? And then I would just get back to normal again. I would be like, fucking this. And oh my God, and my leg, I got to heal now. I got to take it. But I was like, there's something else whispering to me and channeling and, and coming to me and downloading and uploading and saying, like you can heal like they're saying this but don't know you're gonna you you can we can heal you you can heal and i'm like i'm healing i could heal okay but so it was guiding me it was guiding my intelligence it was like talking to me and i didn't doubt it i i believed it and i trusted it and i knew and i know and that's what it took and you know everyone was like astonished by my case uh they called it like a poster child or a case or we've never seen this we've in all the years we've seen severe car accidents but the one similar to yours we've never seen someone um that is mangled hit a house the way he hit a house ejected out of the vehicle you should be dead like your brain trauma your head trauma this is not normal. You got a, you ejected out of your vehicle. You hit a house. Like, do you have like they were wondering like where's the cracks in your head? Like where? How come? Like what? Like what happened? Are you just an angel? Like what happened? Right? And scratch. Well, besides these scratches, it was like they felt it was it should have been more scratches. Like you know, and. So they took me in for all the things and the surgeries eventually and uh, was like more things, blood tests and doctors would come to me and be like, listen, you know, officers are here. They want to talk to you. We did your blood test, your 10 times. So they just started telling me all those things. Your blood alcohol is 10 times over the legal limit. Were you on mushrooms? You were on cocaine, but they call it different terms and uh, like scientific terms for mushrooms and and cocaine and all that kind of stuff and i said huh i don't know <laughs> and um i said yeah i must have been and they said well now you got to deal with this you know and so i had to learn how to break cycles and patterns and karmas like pattern recognize my life how it came into existence i had to repeat like anger and and trauma and like like i got the criminal record i had a criminal record i lost my license um i i have so many different records <laughs> um and my license was taken away from me uh my children were taken away from me uh my own son was came and visited and he was programmed to tell me you know you shouldn't be drinking and driving and i was like that's what i'm hearing from my son like wow and i was i was just you know i didn't want to welcome anybody into my space into my life back anymore like f no friends showed up the same friends that i was with they had days to show up nobody showed up um the, the, the family members, my mom, my sister, my dad, that, that gave me that life that I experienced that even wished death on me. And because of how bad I was to them, they would say bad things to me. And I don't know, they would, I, I forgive them now. I don't hold it against them. I don't judge them, but we all have said bad things, done bad things, but my, they've said like, we wish you die. You know, I wish you get run over by a bus or you should get hit by a car. I wish you were never born. Uh, they've said these words to me and they stuck with me. They really hurt and broke me. And uh, for years, you know, throughout my life um, and and seeing them at the hospital, just it didn't resonate. And I just wanted to. It was so hard, right? Very hard, especially with the type of guy I was to see that and accept it. So um, I had a hard time, a very hard time, a very hard struggle for several years, uh, discovering my truth, uh, learning how to learn again, 
learning how to do everything, but the healing came fast. Like I just, my spirit knew and my, I, I went into my brain, I went into my cells and I, I told I'm fusing my legs back together, uh, my bone and that happened and they would do a scan or they would find out that, yeah, he's right. He did that. Or my paralysis healed faster than what it should ever do. And they were like, what is happening? Like, it's like a rapid. And uh, they, they did not know. They had doctors lined up to study me. Specialists doing different tactics on me. They had different uh, therapists and special specialists, physiotherapists, trying to figure me out and, and work with me to, to heighten their skills. So I, I was being used for other people like, you know, uh, like, wow, they were observing my recovery process, uh, you know, and I just knew what they were trying to do wasn't working. Yeah, they finally said it's a brachial plexus and it's a C5 or L2 and all this kind of stuff. They finally start to learn. But by the time I was going to all the appointments and they were learning, I was already thriving like I was already walking I went back to work in within a month and a half of my life's work I walked back into the building and everybody thought they they're seeing a ghost because I was still in the newspaper and people were still reading the newspaper and imagine walking into the work into the building into the cafeteria and they literally backed up and they're like talking and they thought I was a ghost until I walked and I started working and they're like, Malcolm, Mal Mal Malcolm. And they had to come and touch me. And they're like, oh, I thought you were a ghost <laughs> because I, it was so quick that I came back to work. And because I was in the news and I was in the papers and they thought like I was dead for sure. And who shows up to work in, in like a month and a half? Uh, I did because I, I just started healing, going to the gym and started healing and, and thriving and getting, but I was getting back into the, the cycles and the patterns, hanging out again, getting back into the normal routine of life with the same mind, the same toxic subconscious. And so the discovery and the learning of transformation uh, took a process, but I finally and eventually uh, reversed time and space. And I rewrote my destiny and my blueprint to life. And I quantum bend and I quantum jumped. And I'm using lingos we all hear in personal growth, but I did not know what it was back then. So now I'm using words that people recognize. Uh, back then, I now I call it in my curriculum, it's fraudulence. We have to face our fraudulence. We have to surrender and detach. We have to be uh, understand what being sick and tired of being sick and tired truly is. I've been speaking these things for 15 years before I started hearing them on YouTube or personal growth. Like I've been using these hard, hard words uh, before I even knew who David Goggin was, was or who any of these Tony Robbins people were. I was already doing all this, but I didn't know how to put it into uh, a method or a process or a teaching. I was learning myself. Like, what am I doing here, God? What am I doing, Source? Why am I quitting bread and dairy and cheese? And why, why am I being compelled and dwelled to command and demand my life into existence? Why am I shifting reality? Why am I able to make more money? Like, I'm unhappy with the money. I'm going to manifest more money and I can make more money in my sales jobs. I quit construct, uh, work, construction, labor, and I started working in sales and I started becoming number one in every company that I worked for. I'm like, like I had the power to do so much. And then the, that same power told me, you got to leave the nine to five corporate world. So I have a whole more years and chapters of my life. I had kids, I had more kids. So my first kid that I talked about was five years old at that time, he's 21 now. And my, my other kids are nine and six, right? 10 and six. And so like these things, I had to learn how to be a father, how to be a better 
person, a better son. Like I had to be a better brother. I didn't know how to be a brother to my female sisters. Like I did not know how to love and respect and understand. I didn't know boundaries. I didn't know how to love a woman. I didn't know how to love a man. So I had to learn everything and it was hard, very hard. And it was, it was like going against what I thought was reality and, and lying to myself. But the, I was lying to what I was so born. I was born with that. And so it was to shift, to shift that person is a different type of shift. Um, and so that's, that's my story. That's an incredible story. Lots happened and your entire life is completely changed. Uh, you talked about how when you were in the hospital, there was kind of like this channel and they were telling you whispering from the other side or wherever it is. Oh, that was my spirit. Your spirit was telling My spirit was talking to me. Do you still have access to that? Is that still open? Every day. Yeah. And do you use that to kind of guide you throughout your day, all day? I, ever, nonstop. I, I, it, it, it's, it's what I am. I'm guided intelligence. It's created me. It's done everything for me. It's God. It's connected to God. I'm so humbled and grateful. I use dark energy, negative energy to channel into how far I've come. And I cry using the memories of what I've gone through. That dark energy has propelled me to see the light. So I, I definitely know, and that's why these healers and Reiki masters and chakra specialists and yoga mass people and psychologists and therapists and doctors. And, uh, you know, I'm working with people with Parkinson's and it's, it's beautiful. It's so humbling and, um, you know, autism and they're working with me and they're transforming. I'm making them conscious aware, like an autistic child that's 26 and so many years has gone by, the mother is feeling blessed that this child is aware now. And these things make me cry. Uh, they make me, but I learned, how do we use it? How do we use, we don't use, I don't use it for ego. I don't use it to be like, oh, I did this. I do this, I do that. But when I say it, it comes from like such where I come from, the gratitude, the appreciation, but I talk with so much confidence and conviction that any other Tom, Dick, or Harry would be like, oh, he's egotistical. Why is he talking about what he's done? Well, listen to my, my, my information and, and then you'll know that, you know, I use it for growth. I've used my pain for growth. I, and I'm being blessed, right? It's, it's blessing. You talked about your subconscious and this kind of like Zeus figure. Maybe your subconscious was creating that. Were you raised in a religious household at all? Many. So four different types, five different types of different cultures, religions all around since I grew up. I was I studied Roman Catholic. I studied uh, Jehovah Witness. I've studied Hinduism. I've studied um, what, like understanding Muslim because my family were Muslim. So I really didn't have to study it. If you're your family, your some cultures are Muslim and, you know, so I didn't have to study it. It's, it's, that's what they, we are. They are even Hinduism, like going to temples and prayers and pujas and witnessing so many blessings and so many entities and so many, my mind was already aware of all of this from childhood, uh, Christianity and understanding the Roman Catholic and the Vatican and knowing, you know, uh, Mary and Jesus and then there and then expanding my mind to the true Ethiopian cultures of Christianity and how, you know, Jesus is really truly black, not Caucasian and the, where they derive from religions and cultures and what's being hidden in society and all these all these agendas that we're not so conscious aware of all expanded my mind after my near death. It, I've, I've, I, I get downloads and I'm in tune with things that I'm a part of conscious global conscious awareness. And I find out about it. Like I thought of this three weeks ago. Now it's, it's happened. It's created. Uh, you know, I, I download a book I get and I write and I self publish a self help book for children. Um, you know, and it just comes over me. So these things, everything we hear in personal growth and development, if you are a researcher, learner, educator, uh, science, quantum science, string theory, 
uh, bending reality, uh, the observer effect, all these things I've discovered from practicing and doing them. So I, I just, I think it's beautiful, you know, that we can choose and make these choices uh, now. We don't have to look at what's happening to us, but we can change how things happen for us, right? So what were your thoughts about death or the afterlife before this happened? And do you feel like those colored your experience in any way? Um, before I was just like everybody else, scared and worried and like, oh my God, I don't want that to happen. And oh, like, but I challenged it. Like I was literally challenging death um, and it challenged me back and said, all right, we're going to kill you today. You're going to die. Um, are you sure you want to die? And I'm like, 100, 100 kilometers an hour. Yes, kill me. And I hit a house and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm going to die. Okay, you're going to die. You're dead. And that's what a lot of people are doing. We're addicted to drugs. We're, we're, we're uh, self-sabotaging. We're, you know, we, we, we're searching for diagnosis. We're searching for what's wrong with us. And that's the worst thing to do. Don't relate to what those are social con constructs. Those are paradigms. Those are uh, designed by, by, by society. Like I'm, I'm telling you. So what would you say to a, a skeptic or a cynic? There's a lot of people out there who have difficulty in accepting near death experiences. They say maybe it's DMT or hallucination or lack of oxygen to the brain. What would you say to them? that I, I'm just like that too. I'm a skeptic and I would say things even till today. I watched some near-death experiences and I'm like, <laughs> no offense, but sometimes I'm like, well, what are you doing with your life? Like, are you just here to share a story? Are you here to keep sharing the same story or are you here to do it with purpose and fulfillment to be a guiding light for others? Yes, but what more can you do? You know, are we like, I looked at people like that too. Oh, maybe it's just this, this. I'm very uh, logical and critical and analytical, but I'm also this, what I, I'm all things and everything, you know, and I'm not one thing. I am expansion, right? So I, those people, if, if they saw that, they'd be like, oh, okay, he's, he's like me, but he's, he has more of him that meets the eye or, cause I was a skeptic. Like, trust me, I had friends that were, uh atheists i had cultural religious friends i had like i understand uh chameleon like mentality personality i understand thousands uh thousands of people because i've i've met thousands and thousands of people one on one i used to be a consultant uh sales i i've done in one day, I would talk to 100 people. I've and I've worked there for years. I've been in in sales uh, for over 15 years, so I understand people. I've, I've met so many personalities. Uh, I've I've had so many interviews. I've I understand uh, these things. So what I would say to them is nothing. Just I would talk to them and understand them, and and they would find out about me, and they'd be like, well. They, it would expand their mind. It would just be like, oh, so he's he talks like me. He says the same thing like I do. He judges like me. He he talks about drugs like that. He thinks he mocks people too. Uh, he says things, but it's how we use it. If you're going to stay like that for the rest of your life and it becomes toxic and negative and becomes your trait, your habitual internal dialogue, that's a problem. But if you know what you're doing with your thoughts, feelings, and emotions, there's a huge difference. You know, don't condemn, don't take it far. You know, I learn how to switch, right? So, but I don't need to convince. I don't convince people. People need to convince themselves, right? So he'll, they'll go through their own experience. They'll die and they'll find out that, you know, he'll wake up. You know, he's right now, he's probably unconscious using his, uh, judgments and his uh, observations and what he's noticed in life, but he hasn't expanded past that. You know, I always say to everybody, expand past that. Study, 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 research. I've watched over 100 biographies, documentaries, podcasts, probably thousand doc podcasts. Uh, so 
Why? Whenever my mind tells me, oh, don't watch that, watch this, I say shut up and I go watch what my mind was telling me not to watch. I don't just stick to positive. I watch negative things. I watch criminal things. I watch psychopath things like documentaries on, on doc, like all these things, because what it does, it's, it's how we wire and how we're expanding. We got to challenge ourselves, right? So I can't change him. I'm not here to convince anybody. I think it says a lot too that you had a miraculous healing. Even the hospital staff was in shock and awe over the how quickly you were able to heal and get back to work and everything else. So there had to have been something else at play there, more than just a DMT experience. Yeah, right. So you can come up with your own conclusions, but I can I teach it. I had clients that had pain and suffering that they just copy copycat they just copycat and I tell them what to do and I guide them and they copycat and they do it and they're like my pain is gone I went to my doctor Malcolm and I was on this much milligrams of this and it's I'm off of it I don't take this I don't they're shocked I don't have the pain now when I wake up because I just told them what to do it this stuff can be taught right it can be taught but how much are you willing to sacrifice commit and do right so you came back with this kind of healing gift and then you share that with the world now. Tell me about that. Not just healing. Every person is very different and very unique, right? So yes, a lot of things are very universal, but, but what if someone needs someone to listen, to talk to differently? What if someone needs to be heard, seen, and felt just very differently? You know, they've been to psychologists, they've had therapies, but what is so different so I'm always looking for something, a root cause or where things stem from differently. I, I have a process, but it's like, they just, I'm very different. I'm, I'm very different. Um, and I, I help so many types of people. It's not one, like, where did a Parkinson's person come from? Where did then, then autism? And then like, uh, suicidal and then like uh drug addiction and then it's and i'd it's just i'm you know i just feel that people need baby steps they need the things that they have never received in their life before they need the guidance the whispers the awareness the knowing the trust the confirmations the more confirmations they get, the more willing they become, you know, they need to trust in the unknown. They got to be in the unknown knowingly, you know, these, these typical terms we use, but I guide them through it. So they, they see it differently. It's not just, Oh, being the expected, unexpected, you know, expectedly or, or uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't just say the words, I teach what that really truly means and feels like it's a process. So just because on a podcast or an interview, I say those lingos, um, but it's a process to really understand. And then it comes down to that's, it just, it just expresses itself through the mind, body, and spirit. And it rewires their brain. It, the, the, the wiring and firing in the brain, the synapses, the connections, the, the harmony, you know, the brain and heart, all of these words we hear from other specialists, it could be guided step by step, everything. If my viewers wanted to reach out to you to get some more information, how can they find you? I would say do your diligence to research. Uh, don't just, well, pull the trigger, but don't just, um, not do your homework, right? Find out, you know, go to my website, look at, you know, my package deals and like, look at my testimonials, you know, be ready for yourself because don't expect to be convinced. That's what I would say, because I don't convince people know why you're coming to someone. And, um, what I'm saying is guidedintelligence.ca and my name uh is malcolm nair um and yeah so people could find me all on social media or my website 
I have reviews on Google and I have review uh, testimonial videos on my YouTube channel as well. And I have a children's book called Arnav's Affirmations that is a personal development book for awareness, ego, letting go, and uh, you know all of these things that I talk about for children. And it's an advanced read, but it's called Arnav's Affirmations. And you know it's a it's a beautiful book if you want to grab it. That sounds beautiful. I like how you're going back to try to help the children when you children? have a severe childhood. So children, I'm sorry if I can say this. I first, when I was going through this realization of what I'm supposed to do in life, it started with children. I'm like, the inner child, my inner child has started with child, children. And I'm like, our inner child, our children need this programming, this reprogramming, this hypnosis of how to set their intentions, how to affirm their life into existence, how to have confidence, how to have conviction, how to trust, how to let go of bullies, how to, I've, we've gone through that bullying and trauma and self-sabotage, children go through all that. So we need to learn how to rewire and reprogram our children, even within us, our children. Um, we got to look at our our wives and our partners and our families like we got to we got to look at things differently. And when we change that way, we look at things, then things will slowly but surely start changing. If you had to kind of leave the audience with one last kind of final takeaway, if you could put all your experiences together, what would you say? I would say pay attention to um, your denial, your fraudulence, your naivety, and uh, what we tend to dismiss and we don't pattern recognize uh, the cycles. So when we notice like things in our life, in our home, with our cars, with our children, with our ourself, what we're attracting, what things keep happening, there is a way to actually pay attention to those cycles and then and then change and shift the pattern pattern recognize and then your karmas will start adapting and changing and synchronicities will happen but face your fraudulence because we can lie to ourselves we can lie to everybody else but your poor inner child your poor inner spirit is suffering and watching you and observing you and noticing you and, and you're not recognizing that you're the observer, you're the noticer, you're not your brain, you're not your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So that's what I would start with. And it, there's a lot more uh, steps and guidance and talks that would get them to understand more. Um, but if you can grasp anything from that, it would be great. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for being my guest today. It was just an absolute pleasure to have this time with you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.